thank you very much for ICASA for the opportunity for Telcom to present. My name is Andrew Barnes. I head up the regulatory affairs unit within Telcom. The rest of, of the team to my left is Richard Mayur. To my right is Isaac Kutsia. Uh, we have Tami Kikana. And then we've also invited Andre Wills from uh, Africa Analysis to be part of our team for this afternoon. I have some opening comments to make. I will call upon Tami, who will raise a specific concern and caution. Thereafter, we will speak to our written submission. We are here because LLU is is possibly the most intrusive and far-reaching form of regulatory intervention if one assumes that uh, structural separation resides with a competition commission or competition authority. So it's clearly a form of regulatory intervention that is most intrusive and that is far-reaching. It is important to note that when it was introduced in the U.S. in the mid-1990s, when it was introduced in the EU uh, around about 2000, it was done so under a set of different market conditions and a complete different set of institutional arrangements. Notably, that the markets for FIX were fairly secure matured and that fixed penetration rates were quite frankly in some instances close to universal access. Th those on the panel and perhaps those in the audience who are familiar with the PIAC process would also remember how it was transplanted to the South African context through the lobbying efforts of the multinationals, through the PIAC engagements, and those that will remember, in particular, the sessions that was called by the former chair of ICASA to give effect to some form of unbundling in lieu of the PIAC discussions that was underway. So we have a situation where there are 15 years in the US and approximately 10 years of, of knowledge that informs local loop unbundling. And if one looks at that body of knowledge, there is universal recognition that the implementation is complex, both in terms of, of really integrating technical, social, financial, economic regulation to give effect to local loop unbundling. There is recognition that it's, that it's costly, both from a perspective of compliance, but quite frankly also the larger transaction costs of giving effect to it. And I think there's recognition that in some instances it has been counterproductive. In fact, the Americans and the, and the Europeans speak about it's a mixed bag. And so counterproductive in the sense that it has often not realized its stated objectives, and quite frankly, others have alluded to it, the intense litigation that has preceded the implementation of LLU. So it should come as no surprise that the telecom has taken a position to caution against the unbundling of the local loop. There is just so much at stake, I guess, for telecom, the consumers, industry, it cannot be left to many of the speculations over the last two days. It cannot be left to the potential of regulatory failure. The fact of the matter is Telcom is the single biggest investor in network infrastructure in the telecom sector. The fact of the matter is Telcom is the single biggest employer in the telecom sector. And the fact of the matter is Telcom has been one of the biggest contributors to government from the telecom sector. It is our view 
it is our considered view that LOU will put these matters at risk. And so in essence that is what our written submission has spoken to. I'd like to, to call on Tami before we go into the substance of our submission because there is an issue of grave concern and caution that Tarkom wish to bring to the authority. Thanks, Andrew. Um, good afternoon, Chair and Councillor Curry and the Council Committee. Um, and Andrew has alluded to the grave concern that Tarkom feels with regards to the process um, and the proceedings um, thus far. Uh, Talcom has had the benefits of listening in on the line of inquiry that the authority has advanced to interested parties while they're making their presentations. And the authority has similarly also made various statements um, that Talcom wished to place on record of its displeasure um, regarding the substance of these statements. And our concern, Chair, is not purely for purposes of wishing to raise um, some artificial and legal technical arguments um, in relation to the proceedings that are currently underway. Uh, the, the matter is purely of principle. Um, in our own submission, uh, Chair, you'll, you'll recall that uh, we've spent quite a considerable amount of time elaborating on the importance of this process being undertaken in a responsible manner um, and consistent with the formulation of the law and in particular um, Section 4B and Section 4C of the CASA Act. Um, Telcom has been quite explicit in uh, alluding to the fact that we are of the view that the process embarked upon by the authority is not consistent with those provisions and as a matter of principle um, that our observations of the proceedings that commenced yesterday and certainly has continued um, throughout the best part of today is our concerns are primarily based on the authority's conduct. Uh, but prior to making these remarks in, in relation to what our, our concerns are, I, I wish to preface these concerns within the context of what Talcom has submitted in relation to Section 4B and Section 4C. We've made, we've made very compelling arguments um, we submit in relation to how this inquiry ought to be conducted and commenced. Um, and for the sake of brevity, Chair, I'll, 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 I'll stick to the high level points of why we view that this process um, is not strictly in accordance with what the law provides for. Uh, our reading of Section 4C1, which of course provides for the procedural aspects of how a Section 4B inquiry is to be undertaken, clearly mandates the authority pr to prescribe the procedure. And one can reduce the debate um, to one of timing. When does the authority prescribe the procedure? Is it prior to commencing the inquiry? Is it during the inquiry? Or is it at some stage um, between the two spectrums? And Chair, you'll be aware that our submission is that given the, given the, the nature of rights that are set out in Section 4C, namely due process rights, as well as constitutionally protected rights, the reasonable and perhaps logical and perhaps the only means by which um, a logical interpretation of Section 4C could be given is that the authority is enjoined to prescribe this procedure prior to commencing a Section 4B inquiry. And we say this for two reasons. The first reason, of course, is that any interested party wishing to participate in a Section 4B inquiry after having been given notice thereof ought to also be made aware of the manner in which the rights that are clearly set out in Section 4C and afforded to these interested parties are to be exercised and invoked. And secondly, the very nature of the rights are of such a fundamental nature that interested parties ought to be given 
this prior notice. And so our view is that not having set out what this procedure is going to be, we're in a position of not really understanding the scope of this inquiry. And our observations is that the scope of this inquiry has assumed a rather dexterous um, complexion throughout the process of yesterday and, as I said, the best part of today. And a clear indication, there can be no clear indication that the authority has seemingly expanded the scope of this inquiry to include issues which had not been initially contemplated as part of the discussion paper. And with specific reference to the issue of structural separation, which is seemingly being proposed to be imposed upon telecom as some sort of a remedy which is within the scope of this inquiry for consideration, as well as the proposal to dispose some assets belonging to telecom, constituting our local exchanges. Now these issues have been directed at interested parties and the authority has sought to solicit the views of interested parties in relation to these two issues. At no stage or juncture, either prior to the gazetting of the discussion paper or any subsequent point, has the authority raised these issues as part of the consideration of this inquiry. And so Telcom is left in a very difficult position to try to understand the extent to which our participation is going to be meaningful. We're clearly not prepared with respect to, to field questions which we consider are beyond the scope of this inquiry. And indeed, Cho, we are not the first interested party to lead to this. I think various interested parties have selectively raised issues which they consider are irrelevant for the purposes of this inquiry. But I think the position of Telcom is slightly different to those interested parties. Of course, what is at stake here is the commercial viability of Telcom, as well as whether or not the local human bonding process is indeed desirable in the first place. And so the conduct of this inquiry must be undertaken in a very responsible manner. And the scope thereof, we propose, Chair, is that in the absence of this clearly prescribed procedure, that the scope be confined to those issues that have been raised as part of the discussion paper. Telcom is very happy to have those questions directed at it. Um, but in having said that, shall we in no manner wish to curtail the authority's probity in the issues that the authority wishes to have clarity on. I do want to mention, though, um, and perhaps this is probably a consequence of the authority's poor planning, Telcom is within a closed period at its current moment. And so you will forgive us if we wish or elect not to directly answer questions that would otherwise result in us having to divulge information, which would be of a price-sensitive nature. Um, the, listings, uh, the listing rules of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange are pretty clear in terms of what that category of information is. And we wish to avoid at all costs um, in having to provide responses to questions that we are of the view that it would put Telcom in a rather difficult position of having to um, explain ourselves to the listing authorities. So that having said, Chair, and perhaps this is slightly unusual um, given our experience here, we firstly wish to request the authority that the line of questioning and the consideration of issues be strictly confined to those that have been raised directly within the scope of the discussion paper. We also wish, perhaps rather ambitiously, to extract a retraction from the authority in undertaking that issues pertaining to the structural separation of telecom, as well as proposals of disposing telecom's assets, not be considered as part of this process. Not be considered as part of this inquiry because clearly that had never been the initial uh, contemplation of the authority. And that questions relating to those issues um, not be posed to Telcom. Um, as I said, I wish to emphasize that we do, we do not in any manner wish to curtail um, 
the extent to which the authority and the panel assembled today wishes to engage in some degree of probity in relation to the issues at hand, but we do want to emphasize that those issues must be relevant to the process. So Chair, I'll, I'll pause at this stage um, and perhaps uh, see Chair wanted to interject and, and make a few remarks, so I will pause at this stage. Uh, Tokum, will you please adjourn and meet us outside. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I apologize for the delay. <coughs> the authority and the uh, stakeholder have held frank discussions, and we are ready to proceed. Thank you, Chair. Um, what, what we're going to do, um, and, and I might say that um, because we've been deprived of sufficient time for us to spend on this, the, the issues that I'm going to be raising are not too unfamiliar to you. I think largely because we've already made these submissions in our in response and um, there are perhaps, um, given the time uh, that has passed, more germane issues that we wish to engage in a meaningful and constructive discussion with the authority. Suffice to say, our view of course, and, and, and again this is not something that's completely controversial to the authority, we've shared the sentiment before in public and with the authority. We are unable to find any substantive or procedural powers which are located in the Electronic Communications Act, which clearly and unambiguously contemplates a locally bombarding process. And we've said the statement with reference to the guidance principle, which is a very well understood and accepted principle of constitutional interpretation. Again, I won't go into much detail as to what that principle means, but suffice to say for our present purposes is that Parliament as the legislating authority in the Republic of South Africa possesses the ability to delegate some of those lawmaking powers to administrative bodies such as the authority, and that the exercise of the delegation must be sufficiently constrained by the empowering or enabling provisions in law. And those provisions must be very clearly set out in order for the administrative body to understand both the scope, the ambit and purpose of which the delegation has been conferred upon them. So it is not an uncontroversial position in law. And when we have regard to that position in law and trying to locate some substantive or procedural powers relating to the proposed unbundling of the local loop, we find that no such powers exist. And so our view is that, whether explicitly or implicitly, the reliance in Chapter 8 is unfounded and is perhaps misplaced. And we further go on to say that notwithstanding the absence, either explicit or implicit, of these powers in Chapter 8. Where we have regard to Section 1, that doesn't put us in a better position at all. Because the authority has had to derive a definition of local loop within the discussion paper. And that definition does not in any manner resonate with what, with what is being provided and set out in Section 1. And so we say the obligation to lease as set out in Chapter 8 clearly pertains to those electronic communication facilities which have been explicitly set out in, chapter, in Section 1, I beg your pardon, of the definition. And where we have regard to that definition, in order to understand the precise scope of regulation, in other words, what is regulated and what is not regulated, we do not find that definition which the authority has set out in the discussion paper as it pertains to local loop. Nor for that matter do we find a definition of unbundled local loop. Because of course that definition would presuppose that there has been a process of unbundling the local loop. 
And as previously stated, we don't believe that sex of chapter 8 of the ECA sets out this procedure in any degree of clarity. And we've noted the authority's reliance on section 44.3M of the ECA in attempting to derive this obligation to unbundle. And what we've set out in our own submission is that the context of understanding the, the purpose of this provision is rather specific and self-contained within the provisions of section 44. And we, th we say this for, for one reason. The reason is that the measure itself is intended to ensure that there is no anti-competitive bundling or tying of facilities and that the meaning of unbundled electronic communication facilities means that these facilities must be presented in a disaggregated fashion. And that has a specific meaning which is distinct from an unbundled fashion with specific reference to the local loop. So in other words, the obligation to unbundle cannot reasonably be derived from section 44.3M. This provision clearly doesn't set out how you meant to unbundle the local loop, which in its current format is integrated. And so we say the reliance on this provision to derive some obligation which entails that the local loop is unbundled in a particular fashion is misguided. We also say that the authority has indicated that its contemplation of this process will result in the promulgation of some LLU guidelines. Again, upon perusal of section 44, as well as the broader context of chapter 8, we find no provision whatsoever which empowers the authority to derive these LLU guidelines. Indeed, we're not entirely sure as to what the legal status of these LLU guidelines would be. We do, of course, pause to consider whether or not, if Talcum were indeed incorrect in law, um, regarding the interpretation that we've given to Chapter 8, and we, we, we pause to posit that it's unlikely that we are. We do, we do pose to the authority, though, that were these powers to be as explicit as the authority has stated they are, then what would be the rationale of undertaking a Section 4B inquiry prior to explicitly exercising these powers in the manner contemplated and as perceived by the authority? Presumably these LLU guidelines are intended to facilitate the implementation of local even bundling. However, we find no reference to guidelines when we have regard to Section 44.3M. So in other words, if the authority was taking the point of departure that there exists an obligation to unbundle the local loop, our reasonable expectation would be that that provision in the Act would set out in sufficient detail the procedure to be undertaken in order to give effect to this obligation to unbundle the local loop. And we do say that there seems to be a conflation on the one hand between an obligation to lease facilities and on the other hand the obligation to unbundle facilities. But of course presupposing that the local loop or the unbundled local loop constitutes a facility as defined in section 1. And lastly Chair, a mere eight months or so ago the authority promulgated the electronic communication facilities leasing regulations and one of the most important aspects in order to understand the purpose, scope and ambit of those regulations is sub-regulation 2, which is incidentally entitled Purpose of Regulations. And upon a cursory perusal of that provision, we find no intention set out in there by the authority that those particular regulations are intended to give treatment to the unbundled of the local loop. So in short, Chair, we don't believe Chapter 8 provides you with the powers, either substantively or procedurally, either explicitly or implicitly, to undertake a local loop and bundling process. We don't believe 
that the current regulatory framework, which is conceived to give treatment to the leasing of facilities as defined in Section 1, is sufficiently dexterous and sufficiently robust to give treatment to the complexities of a locally even bundling process. It was never the intention of Parliament for it to do so, and clearly it has never been the intention of the authority to do so a mere eight months ago. So I think those are the, the remarks that I wish to make at this stage. Um, I wish to hand over to my colleague, Mr. Isa Katsia, who will address you on various issues that um, pertain to financial and economic matters. Chair, members of the committee, thank you very much. Um, it would appear to me, if I have regard to various statements made by various third parties, that we may actually have found the Holy Grail. If you look at the slide and you have regard to some of the issues or comments I've listed there, you will see various parties have said that basically if you have regard to LLU, this is really the silver bullet. It will increase competition, it will reduce broadband prices, increase broadband penetration, increase network investments, secure jobs, or at least increase employment, increase network efficiencies, and generate new revenue also for telco. Now, these were a lot of statements or comments thrown out there, and I would like to caution the authority that it should not consider these as facts. It is probable, it may be possible, that there is some sort of correlation between LLU and some of these uh, improvements. But I think one should be careful not to make this the point of departure to say LLU will deliver on all of these. I think it's perhaps unnecessary for me to say that was the case. All telecommunications markets would have been then seen all the perfect benefits of increased competition reduce broadband prices, and the list just goes on. Um, I will not speak a lot about uh, the silence where people have advocated the benefits of LLU, but have neglected to say, but what are the perhaps consequences of the other side, including what are the costs of introducing or implementing local loop and bundling? Who would be the beneficiaries? Clearly, the statements have been made that consumers are the beneficiaries, and that is why we need to do this. But I think we need to prone that a little bit deeper and make sure that, <coughs> indeed, consumers would be the beneficiaries of low group and bunding. Also, I'm just raising a question. There's been <coughs> a bit of silence as well as to how low group and bunding will benefit underserviced areas or poor customers. Of course, the, the lack of empirical evidence is also a note of concern. Chair, I would just like to deal with a couple of myths. These are important. Um, a lot of statements are based uh, on the premise that these myths are correct and true. Um, I will deal with two of them and then um, I'll ask Andre Wills to, to consider the third one. The first one being that taxpayers have funded Telcom's network. It's a very popular notion. People like to believe that. Um, it has been said by various parties. Uh, but the simple matter of fact is that this is not true. Telcom was corporatized in 1991. And it is true that Telcom received assets from government. The value of those assets was approximately 12 billion rand. However, what people tend to forget that simultaneously, Telcom also inherited liabilities from government. And that amount came to approximately 14 billion rand. So basically, the point I'm trying to make here is that it is not true that taxpayers have funded the network and this assets was given to Telcom and it started on a, I almost want to say, a, a positive page. Clearly, we start with a deficit. Secondly, if one has regard to the fact that over this last 20 years, Telcom has invested more than 65 billion rand in the network, 
I'm sure it's evidence or it's evident that one cannot sustain the argument that the taxpayers have funded the network. During this period, it is true, Telcom has received approximately 4 billion rand from government as a shareholder, um, making a contribution to, to the funding of the network, like other shareholders did. But once again, I don't think if you compare the, the 4 billion rand to 65 billion rand, you can come to a logical conclusion to say taxpayers have funded Telcom's network. In addition, um, I think over this last five years, Telcom has probably paid back to government in dividends close to 17 billion rand. The second myth, Chair, um, is that Telcom's copper network has been paid off, so it's a public good, it's been paid off, and all revenues received from line rental basically is incremental or just pure profit. I would like to, to, to point out, and I'm sure my colleagues working for different operators would agree, you don't build a network and then you just don't maintain it anymore. There's ongoing cost in upgrading the network, modernizing it, and maintaining that network. Um, we all know that copper theft has been a significant problem in South Africa, a problem that a lot of other countries have not really had to deal with. Um, so once again, because of, of very specific factors to South Africa, specifically South Africa, including copper theft, vandalism, um, Telcom had to continuously either rebuild um, its network or replace its network. Um, once again, if one has regard, and I know this issue has been raised in a different forum as well, um, Telcom depreciates its, its copper network uh, over 20 to 40 years. So clearly, even if there was a contribution from somebody, you know, if you depreciate your, your network asset, your copper access network for 20 to 40 years, it cannot be concluded that actually the network has been paid off, especially considering the fact that Telcom has invested 65 billion rand over this last couple of years. I think the last point there um, once again makes a point. Over this last five years, Telcom has spent in excess of 17 billion rand on its network. Chair, um, I, at this point in time, I will ask um, uh, Andre Wills, we've asked him to, to uh, very quickly um, investigate um, the myths around the relationship between LLU, job creation, increase in copper lines, um, and uh, the increase in profits for incumbent operator. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, uh, Councillor, and thank you for the rest of the panel. Uh, this is just remote control, so it's wireless control. You'll notice if I do that, hopefully the far end intelligence would move to the next slide. And uh, thank you, Richard. The scope of the presentation really is to look at uh, three aspects. The, us the usage of copper loops, the growth in revenue and associated to that, the costs, and thirdly, the issue regarding uh, staff in an incumbent which undergoes LLU. And uh, the example we've looked at, if I may move to the next slide, please, is the impact of rapid growth of, of local loop unbundling on an incumbent such as BT, and in specifically looking at the results of open reach. And, and one of the important choices for choosing open reach is the depth of quality information that is available to be analyzed when you look at uh, an operator such as this. So in terms of, of what we are looking at, three points is the copper loops, the revenues, and the staff numbers. The next aspect just to bring to your attention is that we've sourced all the information from what's been published either in BT's annual reports or their sustainability reports or the annual KPIs that they put out on an annual basis as well. We've looked from the period to 2006, uh, 31 March 2006 to 31 March 2011. 
and that's based on the observation that OpenReach came to the market in 2005. So we have at least uh, five to six years of history in order to study the impact that, that this has had on the market. I think the first point to move on to the next slide is to look at BT. BT is split into four groups, and, and, and we're looking at BT Retail, BT Wholesale, and Open Reach. The one group that we haven't considered in all the analysis is BT GS, simply because they have a, a, a global operations, and we confined our investigation to the operations in the domestic market, namely the UK market. And just very briefly, when you look at the data before you and you, and you look firstly at BT retail lines, the wholesale lines and full local loop unbundling lines, it shows that over the last five years the, a pattern has emerged. And uh, the reason firstly for 2011 no data reported is they changed the reporting data. In, in 2011, for the first time, they reported on the absolute number of copper loops so as a result, there is a, a disconnect in the data going back from 2011 to 2010 and prior to that. And I think the first point to observe is that uh, following the, the, the creation of, of, of OpenReach and the rapid growth of, of Unbundled Local Loop, what has been the overall impact? Well, the overall impact is there has been marginal growth in the main exchange lines, and those include ISDN numbers as well. However, what you do see is a decline in retail and a growth in wholesale and a growth in the unbundled. If I may go to the next slide. I think the, this one's quite an important point to look at is it speaks to the total number of copper loops in the ground uh, that is operated by the company. And what we saw over the last three years since 2009, 2010, 2011 is that with the rapid rise of local loop unbundling, you don't actually see an extensive growth in the number of copper loops out there. What you, what you do see is a, is a switching behavior of, of loops moving between the different units, which indicates that customers are moving from, from one type of service to another type of service. And what we observed from that set of data is that even in a market such as the UK, three years out or three years back, there has been flat to, to marginally negative growth in the number of copper loops being utilized in that market. The next important trend then is to consider what happens to revenue growth. And we just looked at the revenues reported by the three, three lines of business, and these are gross revenues. We haven't discounted out or removed the uh, intercompany revenue that is also reflected in these numbers. Because you can imagine that there are intercompany sales that takes place from open reach all the way through to, to uh, BT Retail. <coughs> and the first observation to observe is that when you look at the numbers, overall there's a, a, either a marginally negative comp annual, uh, compound annual growth rate over the last six years to a fairly biggish one at 10%, at and that is in wholesale. However, what's more important then to look at is what is the external revenue that BT earns from uh, the market? And if I may go to the next slide. As mentioned, the way the report is structured, the way BT structures the report is reported lines of business. Those lines of business includes two revenue streams, internal revenue stream and an external revenue stream. And the external revenue stream reflects revenue earned from companies other than from BT itself. And what we had a look at over the year is the um, individual revenue growth and then the combined revenue growth of, of external revenue earned by either BT Wholesale and Open Reach. And again, when you look at these numbers, yes, there is growth in, in Open Reach. However, when you look at the combined effect, if effectively it's flat growth. There's actually no growth taking place in that operator. Um, the, the next point to consider is, is what, do, what does the operator actually do? Because when you have flat revenues, you still have responsibility to, to, to respond to your investors. And when we look at the OPEX, and, and the OPEX we looked at effectively is all those costs which sit between uh, a revenue and the EBITDA margin line. And that's what we looked at. So we didn't look at uh, any of the other costs, such as depreciation. And when you look at what has happened in all three operations over the last six years, there has been a cost reduction driving through all the operations. Um, either um, at a compound annual growth of 2 to 3% or all the way up to 11%. What does this mean for uh, staff retention? Well, when you look at the, uh, the UK operations on the next slide, 
um, full-time employment in numbers of the UK staff, and this excludes international staff, by the way. We only looked at the operations in the UK. Those numbers have moved from around about 90,000, peaked at 93,000, and it has subsequently declined. This in light of a rapidly growing uh, um, LLU market in, in that country. So it really does question, firstly, the aspect that when you have a rapidly growing um, LLU in, in an operator, similar to what BT is looking at in terms of the structure, that st staff and employment is either retained or the numbers are growing. In fact, what we see, the, n the numbers are, are moving negatively. I think when you actually look at the next slide and you consider then the question, because in context you need to ask the question, has that been resolved in the wider market in the UK? And, and what we presented here uh, just are, are three indices. Firstly, it's the index of the growth in the LLU index, and, and all we indexed from 2006 as a base year outwards the growth. However, what you then see across the entire ICT market, that the entire ICT market has actually shrunk. And, and that um, even operators such as Vodacom has shrunk, uh, Vodafone, sorry, and along with uh, BT UK operations. So that the staff, by looking at this at a macro level, hasn't um, in effect been absorbed at all. So the job losses are, are absolute job losses. So in, in, in a brief summary, by looking at just one of 49 uh, uh, um, markets, what we've seen is, firstly, the, the I think the assertion that the, that the copper loops grows does need to be tested in more detail. Just from a, a, a competitive market such as the UK where you had a, a particular model go in, the copper loops have not grown. And in fact, what you've seen is switching take place between the retail and, and the rest of the market. Um, yes, new revenue is generated. Uh, as you can clearly see, open reaches revenue is generated. However, the overall impact upon the revenue is, is flat. Uh, the third point is staff protection. Well, it's actually not true in a case such as that, uh, partly because the, the, the operator is under stress and pressure. Even though LLU grew at a significant CAGR, there was still staff retention taking place despite the rapid growth of LLU in that market. And that really is just a high-level short summary of the observations when you look at a, look at a, 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 a model that's been uh, often talked about in the last two days. Thank you. Chair, if I, if I can continue um, with, with our presentation. Let's just bring up that slide. Um, a previous presenter referred to the ghost in the room. So I would like to speak now about that ghost. Um, and it's called the access line deficit. Um, Chair, we, we've previously um, on, on various occasions uh, spoke about it. In essence, the access line deficit arises from the fact that telecom's retail prices for exchange lines are below its cost. It's actually as simple as that. Um, a lot of questions have been asked about, but how is this possible? Where did it come from? How did it sneak in? And the reality of the situation is that there are a number of contributing factors. It's not a specific one single factor. These include social political factors, it includes the, the impact of price controls, it includes probably the impact of competitive pricing, uh, fixed mobile substitution. So there's not necessarily a, a very specific um, thing that you can identify and say this has caused the access line deficit. Suffice to say, it is there and Telcom is currently providing um, exchange lines below its cost. Um, the, the unintended consequence of that chair is that if Telcom had to provide local loop unbundling and if it uh, had to provide these unbundled local loops at, at its cost, it would mean that the cost of the wholesale price of a local loop would be above the retail price. Now, various uh, submissions were made about how important price is in uh, the feasibility of local loop unbundling. And I think what we're trying to highlight here is we do agree, it's very important. And in order to make um, local loop unbundling feasible, both from a commercial and a regulatory perspective, it is necessary that the access line deficit be addressed and discussed. In this regard, we have approached the authority 
to have uh, an engagement on that specific issue uh, and which we believe uh, will happen. Um, with regards to the, the, the um, points made earlier about, you know, is it substantiated? Is it perhaps a figment of Telcom's imagination? Um, can Telcom be trusted? Transparency, etc., etc. Telcom does provide to the authority regulatory financial statements. Um, these regulatory financial statements, uh, which uh, we've relied on to, to, to indicate and show the access line deficit, has been audited. Um, and it has been prepared in accordance with the CASAS regulations. So I think the point here, Chair, is just to say, yes, this is a matter that must be addressed uh, as a matter of urgency. Chair, the, um, this slide just tries to, to perhaps put in perspective. Uh, we speak about unbundling the local loop, but we're dealing with the tip of the iceberg here. You know, there are so many issues that are interrelated, that impact on one another, that needs to be considered. And each one of these specific issues perhaps would require, you know, a consultation process or a study of its own. I think once again, the slide is just there to show you that, that it's not simple, you know, and what we may say or see as, as uh, something that is simple, just implement low group and bundling, we are saying there may be unintended consequences. There is a big body of ice below water level that nobody is seeing, and we need to make sure that we understand the interrelationship between these different issues. We have called for a regulatory impact assessment. We believe that uh, that should address those various aspects. Um, we believe that there are a lot of, um, it's so important and that we cannot afford to make mistakes here. We cannot afford to, to move along, to sail along, and later to realize that we've hit this iceberg. The next slide, uh, Chair, which deals with the unintended consequences. Um, once again, um, we, we, do it, we would like to, to point out to you that it's not clear to us how LLU will promote South Africa's developmental agenda. Um, it's not clear to us how this will support the objectives of universal broadband access. Um, it is, it is our view and our studies have shown that it would have an adverse impact in the South African context on jobs in investment specifically for telecom. It is our view that low group and bundling does have the potential to increase the digital divide between those that have access and those that don't. Um, and of course, there's always the risk of, unless you've got a proper policy framework, that you're just inviting litigation. Now, Chair, you probably would say, and I think you've made the point earlier, that it's not about why, it's not about when, it's just about how. But I think we couldn't leave without just pointing this out to you. Um, the, the, the next slide, uh, Chair, once again there, um, I need to stay up, uh, state up front um, that we are trying to, to add value. <laughs> we are trying to, to, to make a contribution. Uh, and we do believe that the authority should consider various principles and that the authority should actually set out these principles that will guide everybody's understanding of what are the principles that will underscore low group and bundling. Um, I'm saying this, uh, only, I'm saying that these principles obviously um, should, be, should be applied only once we've satisfied ourselves that the policy and legislative framework is acceptable and does support the process and that a regulatory impact assessment actually shows that this is to the benefit of the economy, this is to the benefit of South Africa as a whole. Um, some of these principles for your consideration would include things like there must be full cost recovery, operators should not be uh, forced to cross-subsidize competitors, it should be technology neutral. Um, we do believe it's important that prior to introduction of low group and bundling that there must be a demonstration of sufficient demand. And we've heard 
during these last two days that, yes, just give it to us, we will use. I think once one says, okay, give us guarantees, or let's make sure there are penalties if those demands are not met and we've incurred expenses, then you probably see a change in, 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 in response to that. So we do believe that it's important that we show that there is sufficient demand. We do believe that it is uh, proper to take a phased approach and basically learn uh, from, from our mistakes and learn from lessons in introducing uh, the various forms of LLU. Um, and I think it's, it's perhaps if one has regard to, to protecting and, and ensuring the continued investment in, in network infrastructure, that perhaps one should consider that any new infrastructure investments must be somehow be exempted from low group and bunning. Um, that will ensure that there is a continued uh, investment. Um, Chair, if, if I can conclude, um, we, we do have, and we've expressed our concern that we, we believe that your reliance on the facilities leasing regulations will open you up to legal challenges. Um, we do believe that international practice, and this statement has also been made by various other operators as well, that, that the process is complex and it's, it's costly to implement. Um, we would also like to say that we do believe that the costs incurred by Telcom should be funded by those that benefit from this. Um, and there should be proper cost recovery on the access line deficit. Um, we, we also have a view that um, it should be applied to all licensees. Um, and I think you've made the point as part of your opening remarks. And also lastly, but not least, we do believe that if the authority considers a regulatory impact assessment, that would inform the authority as to the best way forward. I think we can't leave this to chance. We can't leave it to, you know, to just having faith and hope that things will work out. I, uh, I do believe that if one does a proper regulatory impact assessment, we've got a far better base and far more information to make a judgment as to how um, it should be introduced. Um, Chair, we thank you for the opportunity to present to you. I'm sure that there, there are questions. Thank you very much. <coughs> thank you, Tarkom. We have a number of questions for you, and Impilo will start. Yeah, thank you, Chairperson. Having had a look at the legal submissions of Telcom, it became crystal clear to the committee that uh, the definition of electronic communication facility uh, and the interpretation thereof is critical in making a determination whether the authority is empowered or endowed with powers to unbundle the local loop. Quite clearly, we are not on the same wavelength with Telcom and some other operators. To kickstart the process, I uh, would like to go to the definition quickly. The definition of electronic communication facilities leasing facility, uh, it clearly and it has deliberately chosen, that is the legislature, to make use of the expression, but not limited to. Uh, what is your understanding of this expression? Surely you wouldn't suggest that the inclusion of this phrase as a mere verbosity. Thanks, Chair. And might I also finish the committee member's sentence when he seeks to set out what that definition provides for? It clearly says includes but is not limited to any. The definition does not stop to but not limited to. And we've interpreted that but is not limited to any as being a direct reference to the indicative list that is set out from A to J. In other words, when one goes through the Electronic Communications Act, where, where the authority derives um, subordinate legislative making powers, and I'll make reference to these provisions which are very familiar to the authority, 
you, you, your chapter 7, your chapter 8 and chapter 10 clearly provide for the ability of the authority to prescribe regulations. And the common phrase that's been used there, or rather the two phrases used interchangeably, is but not limited to and amongst other things. And we've construed those as being interchangeable for purposes of interpretation. Now, the difference between what Section 1 says and what all those other provisions say in relation to but not limited to is that on the one hand, those provisions directly relate to the authority having been given the powers to expand the ability to derive these regulations. In other words, in exercising the delegation function, the authority may reasonably expand and exercise the discretion to expand what is provided for in those provisions. The difference with Section 1 is that the authority may not expand that definition as set out by Parliament, because that would be a direct and flagrant violation of the principle of delegation. The authority may not expand that which Parliament has delegated for it to do. The authority may not expand the scope of that definition. What it may do and what is actually required to do is give context to what is meant by antenna and what is meant by mast. So in other words, the authority may not expand that definition to include unbundled local loop because that function would be a function that equates to Parliament making law and expanding that definition and the authority does not possess the ability to do so as far as it relates to the provisions of Section 1 and the definition of ECF. Conversely, the authority does have the powers to expand the matters which it ought to give treatment to in the exercise of its discretion when deriving regulations and other sections of the Act. So there is absolutely no discretion afforded to the authority in conjuring a definition which currently does not exist in Section 1. And might, might I point out, Chair, with respect, the appropriate departure point is not what Section 1 provides for. The appropriate departure point is whether or not there is an obligation to unbundle in the first place. And what is to be unbundled? Because our view is that the absence of this obligation to unbundle makes any dexterous interpretation of Section 1 to be superfluous. If there is no ob obligation to unbundle, there's no need for us to have recourse to Section 1. So the very absence of the obligation to unbundle, and we've made it very clear and, and, and emphasised the fact that there is a danger of conflating the obligation to lease on the one hand and an obligation to unbundle as we understand what local unbundling means. So the crisp, answer, the, the crisp answer, answer to your question, um, committee member, is that we don't believe that it is a non-exhaustive list where the authority possesses some degree of latitude to add or subtract to that list because we view that process as tantamount to legislating, which is contrary to the delegation principle. We do view that the important departure point is what is located in Chapter 8 and whether or not there is an explicit allusion to an obligation to unbundle and not so much whether or not local loop unbundling can be undertaken via Section 1. Yeah, I made it clear in my preamble that um, both the authority as well as the cause and other operators, we are really not on the same wavelength when it comes to this definition because we hold a contrary view that the definition gives us powers to expand the list that is contained in Section 1. Uh, be that as it may, I am trying to suggest that uh, the entire definition contained in Section 1 should be regarded as pronouns crypto. Not entirely, Chair. Um, I accept that we may have different perspectives on the interpretation. But I think just to underscore the point that we're making, in the event that the authority does hold the view that you're able to expand the definition, the point that we make with regards to guidance, what is guiding the authority in expanding that definition? Because it surely cannot be that Parliament would give you unfettered discretion to liberally expand the scope of the definition and for the authority to assume a function solely confined for Parliament's competence to add or detract from that 
from that uh, that list. And of course, ordinary statutory interpretation provisions, and of course, which are will also um, crystallise in the Interpretation Act of fifty seven, where the power is granted to prescribe, the power is also granted to withdraw. So, would the authority be suggesting that it has the powers to add as well as subtract? So, in other words, would the authority to view that a cable landing station no longer um, befits uh, regulation, the authority, by your line of argument, would be entitled to withdraw that definition as being subject to regulation? And with respect, sir, we, 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 po we posit that the powers are clearly not contemplated for you to be able to do that. So, notwithstanding the absence of guidance as to how you are going to expand the definition, the crisp point is that if you do view that you have the powers to expand, surely you do have the, the powers to, to withdraw and detract as well. And that clearly cannot be the case. I would like for Obama to put aside the principle of guidance. It's something that I would like to deal with towards the end of our submission. Can we agree on that? So I'll be guided by your line of questioning. Okay. I have no explicit preference as to how you wish to direct questions at us. Going back to the definition, it is our view that we've got uh, a power to expand it based on the totality of the legislation that we're dealing with, which is your ECA. If you go to Chapter 8 of the Act, it clearly gives us powers to make regulation. It clearly gives us the power to make uh, an essential list, which an essential list is included as a local loop. It also clearly gives us powers in terms of Section 443M uh, to come up with a manner in which the electronic facilities listing, the electronic communication facilities will be unbundled. That, of course, depends on the interpretation that you give to Section 1, because if you are of the view that it is expandable, which therefore means that it includes the local loop, which therefore means that um, you can come up with the manner of making available electronic communication facilities, facilities including the local loop. So, Chair, I do welcome um, the committee members' invitation for us to debate what the guidance principle is, uh, because I do want to pose the issue of where precisely that guidance is to be located as to how to embundle the local loop. So I believe Telcom has addressed the authority quite extensively on our view and interpretation of Section 44.3M, and, and, and perhaps it's, it's not necessary for us to, to give extensive treatment to that. Might I then turn to the issue of Section 43.8, which the committee member has mentioned, you will of course note that Section 43.8 is a self-contained provision within Chapter 8. In other words, Section 43 contemplates that there is an obligation to lease facilities and the manner in which to give effect to that obligation is through Section 44 and the regulations contemplated therein. Now, as it currently stated, we do have those regulations in force and as previously stated, those regulations are loudly silent on their purpose of giving effect to locally bundling. Now, the context within which one must read Section 43A and the reference to locally bundling is that clearly the reference to locally bundling in that provision does not relate to electronic communication facilities. Instead, it relates to essential facilities. And if one casts the eye back to Section 1 and what that term of art means, essential facilities, you'll find a rather elaborate definition of what that is. So one at the outset must make a distinction between what is an electronic communication facility as well as what an essential facility is. And one ought not to conflate the two because the regulatory treatment contemplated by Parliament is to give treatment to the one via Section 44 one regulations and the other via Section 43 regulations. Now, as we've stated, the Section 40 sorry, Section 44 regulations, Section 43 aid regulations. Now, as we've stated, the Section 44 regulations are currently in existence, and you will no doubt um, be aware that the authority did commence 
with the process of promulgating the Section 43 Act regulations. I've had the benefit of being intimately involved in those regulations. In fact, I drafted them myself. And the intention thereof is completely different to giving treatment to the general obligation of lease of facilities. So there's an inherent recognition by the authority that the two sets of regulations are completely different and that one deals with essential facilities as defined in Section 1 and the other deals with electronic communication facilities as defined in the same section. If I could deal with the essential facility definition, uh, the beauty of it is that first and foremost, it defines a, a essential facility as an electronic communication facility before the definition goes on to list the attributes of an essential facility, which therefore means that before it is an essential facility, it is a facility, which is in terms of Section 1 of, 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 of the Electronic Communications Act. Unless you want to argue that, let me do this by way of an analogy. If somebody says, this is a beautiful car, does it mean that simply because it's called a beautiful car, it ceases to be a car? Definitely not. Let's now go to the principle of guidance. You have referred to a plethora of cases which talk to the principle of Guidance. I'd like to challenge you. Sorry, might I request a, 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 a right of reply in, in relation to the first part of the panel member's question, or or his intention to conflate the two questions into an aggregate question? I think it was a statement, not a question. Apologies for the introduction, Chair. Thank you, Chairperson. If we may go to the principle of uh, guidance, you have referred us to quite a number of case law, including your Devwood versus the Minister of, of Internal Affairs, Executive Council versus the Western Cape. Uh, what comes out of those decisions is that there has to be some sort of guidance from the legislation which gives us powers to do regulations. I would like to challenge you on this one. Don't you think in, in your view that Section 44.3 of the ECA is in complete compliance with that principle of guidance, as such section literally guides the authority on the matters that must be addressed in the regulation, including the unbundling of the electronic communication facilities? That, of course, includes the local loop, depending on your interpretation of Section 1. What is your comment on that one? So our view is that, um, we've, 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 again, we've addressed our view on what Section 44.3M means. We've addressed the context within which that interpretation or an interpretation is to be advanced in relation to that provision. And, and we, do, we do believe that the guidance set out in Section 44 specifically relates to the leasing of electronic communication facilities as defined in Section 1. It does not provide any guidance on the unbundling of certain facilities. So again, Chair, I wish to make the distinction between the obligation to lease and the obligation to unbundle. And to our mind, the guidance pertains to the obligation to lease and not to the obligation to unbundle. It is for that reason I made a proviso that subject, of course, to the interpretation that you have of facility contained in Section 1. If you widen the definition, it therefore means that it includes local law. Chair, Chair with respect, one, one has to start off by widening the, de the, the, the conception of the obligation and not so much the definition of the facilities in Section 1. So in other words, um, and, and of course, we, we've made this point that there's a danger of conflating the obligation to lease with an obligation on bundle. And I think the departure point is that the two obligations were there to exist in law are completely different from each other. And if one has to conflate the obligation to lease without of unbundling, um, then of course one can proceed on, on the rather exotic interpretation of Section 1 and Section 44. But our view is that that's not the case at all. Um, in fact, we've, we've, we've made it quite clear uh, that the obligation to unbundle and the complexities envisaged 
with the locally bonding process is clearly not contemplated to be given effect by the regulations under Chapter 8. It is a distinct regulatory process and I think um, if, if I may pause slightly to bring up some slides, when, when we talk about guidance, when you talk about guidance, it's interesting to note, yeah, it's interesting to note um, what, what we've done here is we've provided the front pages of the documents um, in foreign jurisdictions that have sought to give treatment to the complexities of local bonding process. Now, in these jurisdictions which the authority is very much aware of, there exists a self-contained regulatory process intended to give treatment to the complexities of local loop bundling. And there the guidance is very clear. You define the local loop as is, as a metallic path facility, after having conducted a thorough understanding of what the network topology is, you then undertake several regulatory processes intended to give effect to the, to the, uh, to the unbundling, to the ultimate unbundling of the local loop. So if, if, if you have regard, for instance, to this particular document here from the European Commission, it clearly sets out the explicit guidance that member states under the European Union are enjoined to follow in embarking upon a local loop unbundling process. If you go to the next slide, we've, we've provided again a, a document which crystallizes this obligation to unbundle is the 2002 Access Directive. Again, it, it very much sets out what that process has been throughout Europe and it provides you with a crisp def definition of what a local loop um, is. If we move on to the next slide, of particular importance, of course, of interest actually rather than importance is what New Zealand has done. New Zealand has specifically legislated a chapter in the Telecommunications Act of 2001 specifically dealing with local loop and bundling. The procedure there is explicitly set out the guidance of the substantive powers conferred upon the New Zealand Commerce Commission are very clear. We cannot possibly say the same about the ECA because it has never been the contemplation of Parliament to give effect to something as similar as that. So when we have regard to comparisons about other jurisdictions and what the market conditions are, we also ought to understand what the prevailing legislative and regulatory framework is. And all these jurisdictions that we can debate as to whether or not the support of the local loop unbundling, uh, whether or not the increase in border penetration was as a direct result of local loop unbundling, all these jurisdictions have given particular substantive and procedural guidance as to how to unbundle the local loop. It cannot be said of the same of South Africa. It sadly cannot. Just switching focus from this uh, intense uh, legal interchange, um, I'd like to ask uh, Andre Wills, uh, how do you understand the impact of the financial crash of 2008 uh, on the issue of job losses in the United Kingdom? Um, can your analysis uh, cope with uh, a factor, external factor like that, um, given that uh, uh, the UK economy took a serious hit. Thank you. The purpose of the study is threefold. Firstly, to look at what happens of the impact of LLU on revenues, on employment numbers, and on the um, uh, copper loop, uh, uh, copper loops. Um, one would have to take the study much further to test for that type of impact on the market. But what we looked at was what were the conditions prior to 2006 all the way through to 2010, and that's what we actually looked at. And then, um, just on the access line deficit, um, uh, Mr. Kutsi, if you could expand a bit on what do you see the impact or what were the socio-political factors which you um, say had a bearing on the, the uh, uh, creation of an access line deficit? Thank you, Councillor. Um, I think we should have stuck to the legal questions uh, and debate rather, but, but let me try and answer your question. Um, the answer to that is, as you will know, um, over this last couple of years, I think from the President's office, there has, there has been a number of statements about the affordability of telecommunications in general. I think Telcom has been singled out very specifically. 
Um, so part of part of the restrictions which Telcom faced were the price control restrictions. In addition to that, in some instances, and, and especially of late, um, Telcom did not increase every year to a full extent that it could, uh, that would be allowed under the price control regulation. And that was basically coming from, you know, uh, the notion that Telcom should not be increasing line rentals, that um, it's becoming unaffordable that line rental is a barrier to entry and um, that customers, uh, you know, the poorest of the poor customers, once you do increase line rentals, it makes it unaffordable for those customers. So I, I think you are aware that, uh, generally speaking, there has been uh, from government's uh, point of view a concern about affordability. And, and therefore, um, Telcom, you know, heeded that concern and, and wish that uh, line rental should be kept as, as affordable as possible. Thanks, Chair. I'd like to ask a follow-up question on the, um, the price control regulations. We are cognizant of the fact that Telcom are subjected to um, price control regulations um, under the old Telecommunications Act. Um, the, the, the price control regulations actually allow Telcom to increase fixed land rentals at, at a greater rate than which Telcom applied for. And um, they were there for a number of years where Telcom did not increase the fixed land rentals to the full extent um, allowable by the by the price control regulations. So if so, Telcom, um, if Telcom is so concerned about the access line deficit, why did Telcom not increase the fixed line rental to the um, full extent allowable by the price control regulations? Because we have um, historical figures showing that Telcom did not actually increase the fixed line rental to the um, extent um, allowable by the price control regulations. Thanks. Chair, um, I perhaps did not answer your question sufficiently. Um, I tried to explain that, yes, in terms of a price control regulation, there was more scope, but because of these social political factors and considerations, Telcom did not increase to a full extent. Um, I think, generally speaking, Telcom took a, an approach we, we've increased uh, line rentals for a number of years with a maximum allowable increase. I think for the last four years, basically Telcom decided because of these pressures to, in, to, to increase line rentals uh, basically in line with inflation and not inflation plus the rebalancing factor for those reasons I explained earlier on. If I can ask a, a follow-up question on that, for how much longer is it sustainable for Telcom to not fully recover the funds for providing a retail fixed line voice, a, fi a fixed voice line? Do we not have to face a point in the very near future that we correct this? Mr. Grutus, thank you very much uh, for that question. Um, through the chair, I, I will answer and, and say to you, you are right. Um, and I think in previous engagements with the authority, we've, we've highlighted this as a, a very important and critical issue that needs to be addressed. Unfortunately, I don't think there's a simple solution to this. Um, uh, if, if Telcom had to fully rebalance and had to increase its line rentals to fully recover costs. Obviously, that will have an impact on exactly those consumers who you are trying to, to protect and to um, you know, make sure that they can have affordable services. So it's really a balancing act. Um, in, in, I think in honesty, perhaps it's not been a good balancing act. Um, trying to, to make these services affordable while at the same time trying to rebalance. So yes, we, we would like to engage with the authority and find a solution. Like I said, I don't think there is a single solution. Um, I'm sure it would not go off very well if we had to propose today that 
that line rentals be fully rebalanced and as from tomorrow, customers would see a double uh, increase in line rental as an example. You know, so we, we have to be very considerate and we have to be very responsible in dealing with this problem. Given the highly competitive pricing in the mobile data space, particularly led, well, first initiated by Celsi and then followed quite strongly with the introduction of Telcom ATA's mobile offerings. Do we, do, does Telcom f still foresee a very strong growth as indicated in your annual reports for fixed line ADSL services? Um, Chair, through you, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure what the projections were, what the statements were in, in our annual financial statements. Um, I guess we would like to believe that we still can grow the market. Um, but I, I cannot, if you would like us to provide you with a more detailed response to that, uh, I can do that. I'm not, unfortunately, privy to all the marketing plans and uh, schemes to, to um, you know, to increase um, ADSL um, volumes. Thank you. If you please do so as a supplementary uh, submission. Um, ju just like to make a comment on the Africa analysis comment. You are unlikely to see growth in fixed lines when, as earlier mentioned, you've already reached universal penetration of fixed lines. So you are unlikely to see a growth in the number of fixed lines being used or installed when you've already reached every home. The South African situation is slightly different. We are starting off from a very low base. Is there scope in the market in South Africa for an increase in fixed lines or are we somewhere else? Thank you. Uh, three years, Chair. Um, the statement, I guess, on the UK would need to be tested because those lines are going backwards and have been going backwards for some time. And irrespective of the growth in LLU, uh, BT has still seen a decline in fixed lines, and that accounts for many of the jurisdictions where LLU has been introduced to start with. So, uh, and even if you look at markets which are developing, and they too, with the, of the introduction of LLU, have seen fixed lines go backwards. So to assume that it only applies to a market where there is universal access, I think, is a mistake, in my opinion. Um, we've studied a number of markets, and a number of the markets which are de developing are seeing negative line growth. So to say that LLU would pick up markets in which are under, uh, underserviced is, I think, would need to be further investigated. Our investigation shows otherwise. Thank you. In Telcom's written submission, page 21, you go to great lengths, and it's a, it's a very nice spider diagram, to show us exactly what the, the, what the iceberg actually entails as to what needs to be done. However, Telcom, to our knowledge, and this is not, this is not direct knowledge, this is perceived knowledge we've picked up from the press as, and as per Telcom's website, Telcom has developed the Chipac product, and there's in the, been in the media the fact that, well, not the fact, the perception that Telcom has already developed an IP stream and data stream product. How true are these perceptions that the authority is picking up from the media? And if they are true, how close are these products to a form of bitstream? If I, if I um, take the opportunity to answer that question, first with regards to CHIPAC, um, the, the, the very technical characteristic of CHIPAC is very far removed from what a typical locally bundling service would be. In fact, we've, we've extensively stated why CHIPAC is at least line. In previous submissions that we've made to the authority relating to the Section 4B inquiry, dealing with wholesale access. 
Um, the inquiry was convened in 2007 and the very focus of the inquiry was whether or not there ought to be any intervention with regards to lease line products. So in our mind, CHIPAC constitutes a lease line service. Similarly with regards to IP stream and data stream and whether or not they relate to bitstream in any manner or form, I do want to make the statement though that we are under um, a closed period and we cannot possibly provide you with information regarding the projected release or otherwise of this product into the market. What I may say though with regards to IP stream and um, data stream is that again they, they, they constitute wholesale services um, which are not in any manner or form um, within the contemplation of what local living bundling is. Uh, we've not conceived chapter 8 as being concerned with regulating services, but rather facilities. And, and that is our answer to that. With respect to your remark about uh, the closed period, would you please provide the information to us a supplementary uh, submission on a confidential basis? So we're quite happy to elaborate further on why we see the distinction between CHIPAC and local urban bundling uh, services in written format, and, and we will take you up on that invitation. Uh, in your written submission, page 48, you state that the authority's approach to LLU should be technology neutral and that broadband is not limited to ADSL and not to fixed line or copper based services only. Any discussion on local loop unbundling should enshrine the principles of net neutrality and Telcom believes that the principle of open access, including access to the local loop, and the equivalent thereof in the broadcasting environment should be equitable, proportionately applied to all licensees in the communications industry, including network providing mobile cellular services. So, do I, am I correct in reading this to say that Telcom fully supports an open access framework at the local layer of a network for both fixed, mobile and broadcasting? Now? How do I interpret page 48? So with respect, uh, the, the, the statement is rather more simple um, than you've, 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 you've sought to give treatment to. The, the fundamental premise here is that we are, we're only seeking to direct, and of course these are summary and conclusions, um, the main aspects of what we do mean by technology neutrality is is made out um, much, much earlier within the RIN submission. The essence of the summation um, and the point being sought to be made here is that we do consider that if in the event that the authority is considering intervention uh, within, within these markets, that it ought to be approached from a technology neutral basis. And that's really the simple statement that we're making. And I think that's underscored by our inclusion of broadcasting services. Of course, local human bundling does not in any manner or form uh, encompass broadcasting services, but just to underscore the point that network, um, uh, sorry, d d technology neutrality as a principle is, is very important and and uh, and we consider that as being the, the cornerstone in the, of any contemplated regulatory intervention. So there's there's nothing more to the statement but purely, as I said, as a, as a summary and a conclusion um, and the point that, that really is being made there is with regards to technology neutrality. Now, uh, Internet Solutions, in their uh, uh, written submission to us, made a recommendation that uh, there should be established an independent LLU management organization uh, based on the approach of open reach, um, that uh, uh, this company should uh, manage, maintain, up upgrade, lease the local loop to competing operators. Um, and they also said that uh, ICASA should ensure the operational separation from, of this uh, organization from the rest of Telcom. Uh, does Telcom have any views on this? Chair, we, we, we do have views on, on the issues um, raised by Internet Solutions. Um, we, I mean, not, notwithstanding that we don't think that they are particularly relevant to the issues that 
um, had been set out in the discussion document. Um, perhaps what um, I would want to suggest to uh, the chair with, with his permission, of course, is for us to be afforded an opportunity to address that specific issue in written responses, um, as opposed to attempting to give extensive treatment to what we, you know, at this particular juncture of the proceedings, do not consider as particularly relevant for the authorities' attention. Thank you. You may do so. Both, uh, thank you, Chair. Both MWeb and IS uh, made mention that the IPC product, they, they made concerns about its pricing, but they also raised concerns that it's not a very efficient way, it's not a very efficient use of networks. What is Telcom's views on those expressed by MWeb and IS regarding the IPC product? So at this juncture, we, we wish to reserve our response to in, in, directly to the to the issues raised by IS and MWeb um, uh, throughout the course of the opportunity granted to us tomorrow to direct uh, specific issues. We have taken issue with those with those uh, specific comments made by IS and MWeb, and we wish to reserve our our response at that particular juncture, with your permission, of course, Chair. I like you may respond to that tomorrow. Uh, you can go ahead again. The Neotel presentation made mention that the best experience for the end user is at the service layer where the end user experiences the service and that the focus should be to leverage off both existing and new infrastructure as much as possible by as many players as possible to achieve as much economies of scale as possible. What is Telcom's view regarding that, or are you going to respond to that tomorrow? So we don't think the question is also particularly relevant to these proceedings, and as a consequence, we will not be requesting the authority to give treatment to that issue tomorrow. We don't think that it's particularly relevant to the context of this inquiry um, and, and we wish not to profess a response to that. Uh, I'm interested in this set of principles for LLU um, and one of them is a reference to a phased approach to implementation. Um, I think it's also interesting that ISPA were also making reference to um, that they saw one of the outcomes of this inquiry as a development of a set of principles. Um, but <coughs> my question is, <coughs> uh, MWeb <coughs> have made a particular proposal. There have been a number of suggestions in other submissions around this notion of a phased approach to implementation. Um, what what does Telcom understand uh, by a phasing of implementation? On slide 13. Hmm? On slide 13. So I think I think what we want to uh, we want to emphasise is that the the most important part, uh, as as we submit in that slide, is. The part in yellow, sorry, part in red that says only after. So we, we want 13. to. Excuse me. Slide 13. Yes, um, thank you. Um, the most important aspect of the slide is the the bold part that appears in red that's underlined, and that reads only after. So, if we do move from that premise, um, that only after all those issues have been given treatment to. What our view is in relation to the phased approach to implementation is that the intervention ought to seek to alleviate market failure where the authority has identified that market failure and that the intervention must be proportionate in relation to that market failure. And in the event that you have enduring market failure which requires a progressive implementation of the appropriate remedies then that is the context within which we're talking about phased implementation. So it is a broad statement in relation to 
the perceived market failure that ought to be addressed in the event that the authority has gone through all those those um, those other principles and presuming that there is an appropriate regulatory and legal framework to do so. Um, and, 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 and the reference to phased approach is a progressive addressing of market failure with the appropriate remedies um, and tools that the authority would have at their disposal and that the implementation ought to be in a proportional reasonable manner. Yeah, in page 26 of your written submission, um, in the penultimate paragraph, I I'd like to go to you in the bottom. Here, Telcom submits that the authority has erred in not having regard to the requirements clearly set out in Section 4C of the CASA Act, and, and this is in itself a substantial risk that the outcomes of such an inquiry may be subject to an administrative judicial review. If you go to page 27, uh, it goes like this. In this regard, Telcom is of the considered view that the authority has not adequately discharged its statutory obligation set out in section, in section 4, capital C, subsection 1 of the CASA Act. It is not very clear to the committee what is the basis of these two submissions. So would you wish me to address you on, on that? Well, I think at the outset of our, um, of our submission, we made it very clear that we um, are of the view that the procedure sets out in Section 4C, which is very important um, to be not only considered by the authority, but in fact the authority is enjoined and bound by that procedure and that the a material aspect of Section 4C, namely Section 4C1, um, which enjoins the authority pr to prescribe the procedure applicable um, for undertaking a Section 4B inquiry. We've stated quite clearly and further reiterated earlier on in our submission that we don't think ICASA has discharged the obligation to prescribe the procedure. And all that we're saying, Chair, is that there is a substantial risk that in the event that the authority wishes to rely upon the substantive aspects of the outcomes of this process, that there does exist a risk, a material risk, um, of a particular challenge being lodged um, pursuant to PADGER. And, and that's really the genesis of, of, of what we're saying there. Um, there is an obligation that the authority has to comply with in Section 4C1 with the view that the authority has not discharged that obligation and to that extent um, the error in law uh, materialises. Perhaps, perhaps, let, let me elaborate further as to why we, we hold that view. There is of course a definition of what prescribed means. And without having regard to the precise formulation of that definition, the basic premise is that you ought to gazette something, either in the form of a regulation or in the form of a notice. But the underlying principle is that there must be some form of a gazette giving sufficient notice and precisely the notice that we had alluded to earlier on in relation to the manner in which the rights, um, no less the constitutionally protected rights, um, that are to be afforded to interested parties wishing to participate in a Section 4B inquiry. So in the absence of that prescription, we, we, we hold the view that the authority has not complied, has not discharged this obligation in relation to that provision of the ECASA Act. Yeah, unless I'm reading from a different act, there is no mention of the word prescribe in section 4 capital C 1 the word used there is determine which I believe there are different ramifications and consequences on the use of the two words there is no need therefore if the word determine is used to come by way of a regulation or a notice in the Gazette and setting out that procedure 
Secondly, if you look at that very section, section 4, capital C, subsection 1, it reads as follows. A councillor presiding at an inquiry conducted in terms of section 4, capital B, must determine the procedure at such inquiry. So it means the procedure has to be determined by the councillor presiding at the inquiry at such an inquiry. That's our interpretation, and we have done that with respect. Chair, I, I must apologize for my lapse in, in, in judgment with regards to the confusion of determine as opposed to prescribe. But what, what we have made as the point, Chair, is that you simply cannot determine in the morning um, of an inquiry that is meant to commence that this is the manner in which the rights afforded in accruing two interested parties are to be exercised. And of course, the fundamental importance of these rights being constitutional rights, interested parties ought to be afforded adequate notice of how the authority intends to conduct itself pursuant to these, to these matters. So it simply cannot be that, that the authority constitutes a panel on the morning of the panel and in the morning of, 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 um, of commencing with proceedings, simply say, this is how we're going to do it. Um, and, 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 and Telcom's view is not merely limited to the manner in which the authority has conducted itself in relation to these proceedings. We've raised the issue with regards to the absence of a clear and well-defined scope of this inquiry. Starting from the gazetting of the discussion document, the means by which the one-on-one -on -one engagements had been entertained, the notice given for the conducting and convening of these public hearings, and the fact that the authority has haphazardly afforded the, the, the interested parties um, 14 days to respond to, to questions as, as they come up. You, you know, that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't seem to be a consistency in the means by which the authority has clearly prescribed, or, or, or for lack of a better word, clearly determined what the applicable procedure is, such that interested parties have sufficient notice. Um, you know, the chair, chair mentioned uh, yesterday morning that they have received no application for any interested parties to be heard in camera. Well, the section doesn't talk about interested parties having to make such an application. Then the right is there for us to request such. And had we been given notice, had interested parties been given notice that the, op the opportunity resides with you to make an indication to the authority that you wish to be heard in camera, I'm pretty sure that some of the issues that we wish to be given treatment to as part of our confidential information that we submitted to the authority, we would have taken the opportunity to do so. But there was no determination to that effect, that such an opportunity arises and that interested parties are at liberty to, uh, to, to exercise that option. Yeah, the, the fallacy really of the argument lies in the fact that uh, the authority cannot, at the time it publishes the notice in terms of Section 4B, be in a position to know, be in a position to know who will be attending the oral representations contemplated in Section 4, Capital C, 1. <coughs> so really the authority can not in any imaginable way prescribe a procedure, send it out without first knowing who will be coming to make oral representation. If there is no one coming on the date to make oral representation, what is the purpose of prescribing a procedure? Chair, Ch we, we're saying, I mean, uh, of course the, the aspects of conducting oral hearings is but one aspect of this proceedings. We've had one-on-one -on -one engagements. The authority has, of course, caused notices to be published to give that notice to interested parties as to when they're expected to attend these one-on-one -on -one hearings. The, 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 the point here, Chair, and it's an overarching point, it's that adequate notice must be given in order for the authority to provide interested parties with sufficient notice as to how those rights are to be afforded. It simply doesn't hold that you may wish to determine the procedure as you go along and that interested parties must just get on the bandwagon um, and move at the pace that you want to go on. It's the issue that we've spoken about in relation to the scope of this inquiry. Um, and, and quite frankly, the scope has not been sufficiently curtailed for us to understand precisely what it is. And we, our expectation was that, that that scope would be clearly determined within a determination. Let us move on.
Um, thank you, Councillor. Taking into account the question about the scope, but also taking into account in your summary statements on page 45 that 48 that the authority must treat um, local loop unbundling on a technologically neutral frame. What is Telcom's view on the posited unbundling of the mobile networks and does Telcom view Spectrum as a facility? So we wish to um, reserve um, our right to respond to the issue of whether or not Spectrum amounts to a facility. We, we are cognizant that the issue has been raised by an industry party um, and, and it seemingly the authority is, is keen to get our perspective as to whether or not we agree with that definition. So um, we, we wish to address that issue um, as part of our response tomorrow. If you would indulge me then, would you also uh, respond tomorrow on the following question as to whether you view your roaming agreement with MTN as an in practice form of spectrum sharing? And a question on pricing is if we look at the prepaid service that was offered, the via via product, where the prepaid service is supposed to recover the full cost of the provision of the service, it's the same as prepaid in mobile works, can we really say that there's an access line deficit or is it a pricing phenomenon in the manner in which services as offered have been priced? Uh, my apologies um, through you. We were just debating um, the scope of the question and the implications thereof. But let me try and give you a brief answer on that. I think the, the presentation um, and the specific slide that spoke on access line deficit um, indicated that obviously because the current line rentals are below cost, that is what gives rise to the access line deficit. So I think one can draw perhaps the conclusion there for that it is a function of price, first of all. But I don't think it's as simple as that. If you look at the wire-wire the, the um, specific issue, um, you will be aware, and the issue has been raised, that how is it possible that if a customer pays, let's say, 150 rand per annum, whatever that amount may be, that, um, you know, isn't that indicative of perhaps the underlying cost? And the answer is no. Um, first of all, Telcom sees that as part of its social uh, obligation to provide affordable services. Secondly, you'll be well aware that when Telcom introduced that specific service, we requested the authority to allow us to, to add a surcharge on a per minute basis or on a per call basis. And uh, because the, the wire wire product is a function of, of the rental, as well as a per minute charge. So what Telcom did was to say, well, let's try and keep line rental in that instance as low as possible, and the per minute charge you will obviously increase. And somewhere there will be a, a break-even point. Um, in that specific instance, you know, and that's a difficulty that Telcom faces. When we approach the authority to say, allow us to, to add this surcharge, the authority refused. So, um, you know, and that became quite a big issue between ourselves and the authority. So, I think it's a case of uh, Telcom finding itself between a rock and a hard place. You know, if we um, provide what we, what we see as affordable services, you are saying it's, too, too, uh, it's below cost and it's not, should be rebalanced, it should be higher. When we do file and ask for an increase, the authority does not uh, want to allow that. So what do we do? And I think that just is an illustration of the point that this is a matter that needs to be discussed 
between ourselves. Uh, we don't think there is an easy solution. We understand the authorities mandate, we understand your concerns, and um, it's, a, it's a difficult balancing act. Telcom, I, you've, you've elected to put a number of issues over to tomorrow. Uh, can I remind you, you only have 15 minutes, so you may wish to reconsider and address some of those issues today. Chair, so proposal is noted. Thank you, Chair. Um, are you in a position to tell us what the current utilization of Telcom's last mile network for voice and for ADSO is? Chair, the crisp answer to that crisp question is no. Um, and, and, and not for purposes of our ability to determine um, the substantive purport of the question, but precisely because were we to answer the question, uh, we would be advertently divulging um, information which is of a sensitive nature. Um, it's inherently confidential and um, having stated at the outset that we are on a close period, um, we, we, we respectfully decline to provide an answer to that question at this stage. In the event that, um, in the event that AOU does take place, uh, do you consider that the size of the pie you know, is fixed and that the introduction of AOU will take away business from uh, telecoms retail or telecom business? Or might the pie become bigger because of the innovation that will be coming through as a result of new products from your competitors? Chair, through you, um, I think a lot has been said earlier today and also yesterday that, you know, the market will be grown. Um, we've got a very simple view of that. Uh, we don't dispute that there may be some new additions. But if you look at the, the facts of the matter, um, and, and I think various parties has, has in a very subtle way tried to, to um, not to answer that question, and that is our competitors, and they've said it in so many words, that they've got a business to run. They would look at uh, what makes commercially and, and uh, sense to them. Uh, they will look at the profitability of services. So it is our view and its international uh, experience has shown that um, th those competitors will go after the profitable customers and it makes good sense to do that. So as far as we're concerned, uh, and we've highlighted this as a risk, those competitors will um, go for the most profitable customers first. So in, to the short answer to your question is, uh, I think they're going to take a big slice of the cake for themselves. Uh, they're not interested in really growing with cake if uh, they were, they wouldn't ask for local and bundling. They basically want to take over Telcom's customers. You've stated in your written submission um, that one of the difficulties that you experience in, in the several forms of LAU is that Telcom currently uses the voice telephone number to identify a line. Um, is this obstacle insurmountable as far as you're concerned? Chair, might I request the panel member to direct us specific, excuse me, specifically at the um, juncture in our own submission that we've made this contention? Um, from memory, it was in relation to the full loop unbundling. So I, I, I appreciate that um, perhaps there would have been a probability of us directly addressing um, the difficulties of full loop unbundling. We're just trying to ascertain the context within which um, the panel member is asserting the statement was made. Um, we, we wish to give full treatment to the issue. It's, it, perhaps the statement has been made 
um, out of particular context, and that's why we respectfully request that you direct us at the particular juncture that the statement was made in our own submission. Page 17 of your your last portion, your annexure. It's in the second last uh, shaded, the blue shaded uh, block on that page, under, under item four. Okay. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that when Telcom and all other incumbents built their networks, they were PTTs. They were the only operator in the market. And they built their networks in a technically integrated way accordingly. So to that extent, today, Telcom identifies the, the, the line with a voice service and consequently the line is identified by what we call a DN, a directory, a directory number. An open access or LOU approach then decouples the service from the asset and the, it becomes a problem. How do you identify the asset? Uh, it is not insurmountable, but it is highly problematic be, uh, because, you know, you, you've, if Telcom, for example, uses a directory of asset numbers, then how does the party requesting the line know the associated asset number of the line? If instead the, the person uses the address, then, then how do I resolve that address, which sits at the CRM layer, down through the ETOM stack to the uh, inventory database. And these are the, you know, when Telcom says technical complexities, we're not exaggerating. This is just but one of many of those complexities. Um, related to that, on page 17 of your submission, you made reference to, or you made a comment that uh, it's ill-informed and nonsensical. This was in relation to naked ADSL on the grounds that some of your lines are provided by means of a combo card. How does the fact that the physical equipment is capable of supplying more than one service oblige users to take both services? Yeah. One must recall that Telcom doesn't manufacture the combo cards. The vendors do that and we, we, we purchase them as all other incumbents in every other engine deployment purchase a combo card as we have been doing for many years because this is the most technically efficient way to provide voice and data and leads to the lowest costs. So therefore not providing the voice service is technically inefficient because the voice port lies unutilized at the DSLAM. Furthermore, not utilizing the voice port does not lead to any cost decreases because you've paid for the integrated port anyway. So there's no savings with me turning off the, the dial tone associated with the ADSL. In your current offering, your prepaid uh, uh, offering, Wirewire, you, what are the technical obstacles to providing ADSL? Chair, with respect, we, we find the question to be slightly beyond the scope of locally even bundling. Uh, Wirewire retail services, they have nothing to do with ADSL services. We don't find the question to be particularly um, germane to the issues at hand. The question pertains to the issue of um, naked ADSL, which is not an issue we raised in the in in the discussion, but it is an issue that's been raised by the in the submissions, and it pertains to specifically to the ability to provide ADSL services to the. <coughs> lower LSM levels of, of the market who don't qualify or, or are not <coughs> willing to have a, con a, a contract uh, with Telcom but rather require a pay-as-you-go pay service and the, the uh, fact that um, ADSL service is currently linked to a contract voice service makes it impossible for other operators to offer a pay-as-you-go ADSL service. So, Jeff, if I... If I correctly understand the question then, is, is, it, is it a proposal that Telcom make available a prepaid ADSL offer then? Is, is that the gist of the question? It's not a proposal, it's a question, is there a problem in doing so? And I, I see no problem whatsoever, I just want to get clarity as to whether or not it's a proposal or is it a question? It's a question. Well, if it is a question, Chair, I mean it, it directly relates to potential um, commercial strategy that Telcom wishes to explore at the retail level and 
I hate I hate to say it, but close period, and and we wish not to comment on those issues. Uh, my last question. Um, I don't know if you're prepared to comment on our perception that you are currently developing your IP stream and data stream pro, pro, pro products. When are those going to be available? Chair, need I need I really address the question? Written submission. Uh, Mr. Wills, uh, it was not entirely clear from your presentation what the what change there was in the penetration of data services as a result of OpenReach. In terms of the growth of the data services in the UK market, uh, the study just looked at those three aspects. We looked at it from what was the rate of growth of LLU and the implications it had on the uh, BT group through OpenReach model. So we didn't look at where the final data present, the final data penetration ended. All we looked at was, is it a service that underpins job retention, job security? Is it a service that generates new revenue? And is it a service that grows the total copper loops in the ground? With respect, I think the interest in the South African market in local loop unbundling is not in unbundling voice services. It's in providing data services. Um, yeah, uh, what we showed in the presentation was the uptake of the unbundled local loop. And that would have been indicative growth of the data market in the UK. So, in a sense, you have seen that. Okay, for those of you who are still alive and awake, <laughs> I now invite questions from the floor. Let us begin with our old friends at CWU. <laughs> what are the plans for Telcom to sustain current jobs or increase employment if LLU goes through or if it doesn't? The last part is pertinent. Chair, again, I think the question seeks to ascertain our commercial and strategic response. Um, should local living bonding be implemented? So at this stage, we really cannot comment given the circumstances we find ourselves under. You cannot comment publicly, but you can in a written submission. So I, I actually wish to gain clarity from that. I, I, was, of, I was under the impression that the, the, the queries directed from, from the panel um, by the authority for the authorities' regard um, would be subject to the invitation for the 14 days. It's not entirely clear to us whether or not um, our responses ought to be directed to CWU, um, since they're the ones that are asking the question, or whether or not the authority wishes to have access to that. So, um, could you clarify that for us, please? The response is to us, not to the CWU. <coughs> However, um, I'm prepared to see the point. From uh, Jan Schwartz of CZ Electronics. The lack of services in many areas contributed to the establishment of several hundreds of independent wireless service providers, and he refers to WAPA members, for example. <coughs> Did this not contribute to job losses in telecom? This also contributed to a direct influx of products being imported. Oh, telecom also stopped local manufacturers several years ago and turned to import only. This contributed to thousands of job losses, loss of expertise, etc. What is Telcom's take on this compared to the threat of job losses due to LLU? Fair enough. So I think the only um, uh, relevant point is 
it's really the last aspect of it. Uh, the, the the rest of the of of the question, we don't find any resonance um, with with the line of questioning in relation to the issues at hand. Um, local manufacturing, uh, weapon, we really don't find any resonance with the issues at hand. Can you respond to the last portion? Could you kindly repeat it for me then? I, I thought I'd, I'd take the, the question in context um, in its entirety and not so much in isolated portions. So you said that you only felt the last person was re portion was relevant? Let and I, I just thought I just heard LLU towards the end, but the rest of it didn't really resonate with what LLU is. Uh, Ryan Hawthorne of Neotel wants to know how much is the access line deficit? How was this calculated? <coughs> what capital charge is included in the access line deficit? And what is the access line deficit per line? Chair again, close period. Yeah. Chair, if you will allow me, I think it goes beyond just a statement that's a closed period. Even if it was not a closed period, we are not willing to share commercially sensitive information with competitors. That information has been submitted to the authority. The authority has access to that information, and I think that's where we'll leave it. The second question is, what are TOLCOM's universal obliga obligations? These are referred to in TOLCOM's submission. I mean, th those obligations um, are clearly set out in our 1997 um, license, um, and those obligations were transposed into our converted licenses, uh, which were issued by the authority in 2009. Um, we're quite happy to make Neotel a copy of our license available in order for them to peruse through it, but we really don't see the relevance of it within the context of this inquiry. Okay, and then uh, the last question is perhaps Jermaine. How many copper lines does Telcom have? in total. I think this refers not to active lines, but the total number of installed lines. So I think that number is set out in our annual report, if I'm not mistaken, and we would, we would direct the, um, the person responsible for the question to peruse our annual report to find out that, line, that number. It's not a, a magic number, Chair. It's not a, it's, there's nothing secret about it. Um, I think we're quite transparent in, in setting out the exact number of lines that we have in the grant, so it's the better source for us. Um, for, for, the, for the person who asked the questions on any reports. Tokom, thank you very much. Uh, audience, thank you for your patience. And uh, we shall convene again tomorrow.